Greetings, everyone. How are you doing today? Yes, Very thank good. you. Thank you, Mark. That is exactly right. James and the Giant Peach. Randy Newman. Thanks. All right. So we have um, three topics to just to cover today. We're going to talk about comedy music a little bit. And I'm going to go out, continue on with that animatic, which is kind of comedy. So it sort of all fits together. But I want to start talking today about timing and understanding some of the fa fundamental principles of timing and where it came from, the hist historical development of it, and show you how to, oh, excuse me, show you how to set up timing to figure out where things are in the timeline if you're going to score a, a film. And the one reason why I'm doing this a little earlier than I normally do, because I've been getting mostly very good projects from you guys. And I feel like you can handle it, especially since the class is mostly graduate, vastly graduate students. I think you can handle some of this stuff. In the 1930s, film was scored all live with all musicians in a room. And if you're looking at one of those sort of musical films or like a Fred Astaire where he's dancing, the orchestra is actually just off camera. And those are all live takes. There might be some splicing together of different sections, but the musicians were in the studio playing and that was all going down as if it was a Broadway show being filmed. So they started trying to figure out ways to really synchronize music to picture using something other than a stopwatch. And there's a debate about who invented it, but there was a guy named Max Steiner, who was a very famous, he was one of the, you know, in the first wave of Hollywood uh, film composers who came here from Europe in the 1930s uh, to get away from what was going on in Germany. And there's another guy named Carl Stalling, who did all of the Warner Brothers cartoons, like he did uh, Daffy Duck, he did Bugs Bunny, he did The Road Runner, he did all that stuff. A really amazing composer. And one thing as a tangential point, a little aside, that film scoring back then was a little bit different than some of the stuff that we started listening to from the 1950s with Vertigo and East of Eden, in that they would, these all these composers that started scoring films in the 1920s and the 1930s, like Dimitri Tompkin and others, uh, Franz Waxman, they all had very serious, strict European training, right? I, I, I even think a couple of them might have studied with Arnold Schoenberg because you're, we're talking, you know, you're in your teens when it's 19, in the early 1900s, and Arnold Schoenberg taught, right? And then they all came to America, all these composers, because of what was going on in Europe in the 1930s, and they wanted to get away, and they were all Jewish, a lot of these <clears throat> composers, and they wanted to get away from the Nazis. Excuse me one second. They would think nothing of popping a phrase from Beethoven or Haydn or Mozart into their score because this is the music that they studied and they loved, right? And it wasn't until later in the 1940s that film scores became completely original. So, as you know, analog film is a, st a strip that has a series of still photos, and we've gone over this a little bit before, that occur at a steady rate of frames per second. And that's, uh, and we've discussed some of this before, but I'm just going to repeat some of these things that you've heard before. That's called frames per second, or FPS. And the two most common ones are 24 frames, per, historically speaking, because there's more that are being used now because of the advance of, H, of uh, computer recording inside of these digital cameras. You could do things that you couldn't really do with analog cameras. But the two historically 
most important frame rates are 24 frames per second and 30, <coughs> 30 frames per second. And they are a constant. Once they are set in the film, they are a constant from the beginning to the end, right? So no matter how fast-paced or how slow the action is on the screen, they're either going at 24 frames per second, which is film, or on tel early television, 30 frames per second. And I did talk a little bit about that drop frame business. We may get into that a little bit more in the future, but let's right now focus on these easy numbers to deal with, 24 and 30, round numbers, not 23.98 or 29.97. So 968, 23, 29.968, I think it is. What they came up with was something called the click track. Now, we think of a click track today as a metronome. So if you're working in the recording studio, they would print a click onto the tape in the old days, and people would play along to the click track. This started becoming <clears throat> popular in the 19, late 1960s and uh, 1970s. Not every group played to a click track, but one of the earlier, earliest adopters of using a click track in popular music was Pete Townsend of The Who. And he's a very important figure in the development of music technology and its use in popular music. So what he started doing, and some of you that have taken some of my other classes have heard me talk about this before, but it, it's always worth talking again because he is a very important figure in the development of this technology. And we're using technology to create film scores now, so there is sort of a link between the two. When in the ninth, early to mid-1960s, when The Who was starting out, their manager was a man named Kit Lambert. And Kit Lambert was really a film producer. So Pete wanted to do demos and work on writing songs, and he wanted a way to... He didn't write music down on paper. So he wanted a way to capture songs and give them to the bandmates so that they could learn them. So uh, Kit brought him a Nagra tape recorder that had sound-on-sound -sound capabilities, which meant that you could record something like a metronome on one track and then play your guitar to the metronome on the second track and then get rid of the metronome once your guitar part was down and use your guitar as the timing to then play a bunch of other tracks on top of that one track and build up a demo that way. And then he'd give that to his bandmates. So there was a click track there. And then eventually he started, he had a 24 track or a 16 track machine in his house. And he used click tracks to sync up all of his synthesizers that he was laying down on demos and bringing that stuff into the studio and having everybody play along to the stuff. So that sort of popularized it in pop music. But in pure music, when we are dealing with a click track, we are dealing with something that has a parameter. And can anybody think of what I'm talking about right now? Like, when you look at a metronome, what's it calculated in? Beats per minute. Beats per minute, right? So 60 beats per minute is a moderately slow pace. 120 beats per minute is a moderately fast pace. And that is per minute. And usually in pop music, it's steady from the beginning of the song to the end of the song. And there is a whole philosophical debate as to whether the click track has ruined music because people naturally speed up a section and, and then slow down ne the next section. And that little tension between things being a little bit faster and a little bit slower actually can add a lot of excitement. And if you've got great players like the, the Wrecking Crew or um, the Motown player, the, Mo the, the Funk Brothers or the Swampers or all these incredible session musicians that knew how to create a groove in the studio, you really didn't need a click track. You know, they just did stuff naturally. So that wasn't, but the click, idea of the click track for music wasn't started in popular music. It was actually started in film music. 
And it was started by either Max Steiner or Carl Stalling. And what they decided to do was they would get a, a copy of the film that they were going to be scoring. So not the master film, but a copy of it. And they would actually take a hole punch and punch holes into the soundtrack, uh, into the soundtrack film based upon the mathematics of metronome speed. As the whole, so then if you think about this, it's a film strip, right? And you've got holes punched into one of the sides of the film. And as that, those holes pass through the projector, it creates a clicking sound through the headphones. And that is how they started figuring out how to synchronize music to picture. There are other ways that we'll discuss in the future classes about using punches and streamers, and I've got a really cool video to show that. And you use punches and streamers if you want to get more of a natural feel and just have indicators of where you're supposed to be. But using this click track by punching these holes into this analog tape gave the composers, the conductors, and everybody ways to exactly time things to picture. All right, so up here on the top, I've got the key for my abbreviations. BPM equals beats per minute. Frames per second equals, FPS equals frames per second. FPM equals frames per minute. So this is the PDF called Timing Using a Hollywood Click. FPB equals frames per beat. So we've got beat per minute. We all know that. We've learned what frames per second is. That's 24 or 30. Frames per minute. That is 24 times 60. In one second, you've got 24 frames, and there are 60 seconds in a minute. You have 24 times 60 is your frames per minute. And that number is 1,440. Everybody following me here? <laughs> I know this is math, but we're all musicians. Yep. We're supposed to be good at math. So we've got 14. So every minute, there are 1,440 frames per second in a fr film that's going at 24 frames per second, which is the standard film resolution. It doesn't matter what tempo you're playing at. There's always going to be 1,440 frames per per minute. Now, instead of thinking about tempo as beats per minute, we want to think about tempo in terms of frames per beat using this technique. And the way you do that is with division. So if we've got 1,440 frames per minute and our tempo is 60 beats per minute, we divide 1440 by 60, and we get 24 frames per beat. Now, that's easy to conceptualize because at 60 beats per minute, every second is one beat, and every second there are 24 frames, right? So you can conceptualize that without doing the division. That's pretty easy and evident. But let's look at some of these other tempos. So if you have something at 90 beats per minute, right? The frames per beat is 16 frames per beat. If you have something that's 144 beats per minute, the division there comes out to 10 frames per beat. Now, what are you noticing here about frames per beat and how is that different from beats per minute? Look at the tempo and the frames per beat for these three examples. It's the inverse. The quicker it is, the less frames per, per second, beat. Uh, per, per beat. Right, correct. So in other words, the faster the tempo, right, the less frames it takes to do every beat. So it's sort of the opposite of what we're used to as musicians. Now, there's an issue with certain tempos, right? 
because if we want something at, say, let's say, uh, 134 beats per minute, we do the math, and this is our frames per beat right here. I mean, what is that? <laughs> so you would say that that's actually 10.4 frames per beat. I mean, 10.7 10, 10 frames per beat. <laughs> that, that gets to be a little bit wanky, so you'd have to adjust your tempo. That's why all tempos, some tempos are better for scoring for film than others. Do you need to know this in order to score films today? No, because we're blessed to live in an era where we have a built-in calculator, and that is our DAW. And also, to some extent, a notation program. But it is important to understand the concept, because in a film, things happen on a frame, and a frame is frozen in time on the final cut of a film. It's always going to be in the same spot on the timeline. Music is different because if you play a piece of music at a tempo of 150 beats a minute, the downbeat of measure five is going to occur on a certain time, point on a timeline. If you play that same beat at 80 beats per minute, that downbeat of bar five is going to occur on, the t on a timeline, minutes and seconds, longer, later. So music can be flexible in terms of timing resolution. And it's interesting because most of us here in this class all started becoming musicians as players, right? Some of you I know play keyboards, some of you I know, I know play percussion, some of you play guitar, some of you are vocalists. And when we think of time, I'm a rhythm section pianist. I think of how I fit into a rhythm section with time, or if I'm playing a vocalist with a vocalist, I'm thinking about more of a linear aspect of time and how each beat and unfolds and captures the, what the vo vocalist's phrasing. And that's a certain way of thinking about time. When you're dealing with film, you're thinking about the effect of time on the dynamics of the piece you're creating. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you have a piece of music that you're writing and you want to use the same materials for two different cues. The first cue takes 90 seconds to unfold. And you use your material and you develop it in a certain way. And the timing, the length of that unfolding and that development has a profound effect upon the viewer. If you are composing a piece of music using that same material that's 30 seconds long, you're going to have to get to that much quicker. And that's going to have a different effect on the viewer. And so, my point here is that the understanding of this concept and developing your compositional technique so that you can fit your music easily and make it sound natural within all these different time parameters is really a, a, a big part of film scoring on a technical level. Is that clear what I just said? I know it's a little bit esoteric. But my main point is that there are many ways to think about time in music. And most of us that start out as musicians, as players, we think about time a certain way. An orchestral musician thinks about time in a different way than a jazz musician. Although many younger musicians that distinction is not as great as it would have been 50 years ago. Because many younger musicians 
they listen to pop music or they listen to jazz music that are classical based and they are f they, f they understand through listening and assimilation of that music they understand how the time feels they can play rhythms maybe more crisply and with more of a groove than the older school musicians could orchestral musicians and then there's thinking about time as how it, how it relates to the unfolding of a story with visuals and a script and actors now you could see that I've got my counter set up here now I'm using Pro Tools these are things that you're gonna have to and I'm gonna show in Sibelius how to do this which I sh would shed this morning take notes and figure out how to do this in Logic Cubase Ableton whate whatever you're doing using I've gone over a little bit of this before, but let's just review. So I set up my session, and you can see my parameters here, that my time code rate is 24 frames per second, and my session starts at one hour. We've discussed that in the past, so we should know what that is. And I can change my frame rate. I've got all these different frame rates in Pro Tools. And you can see 23.976, that's drop, 24 drop, right and this is 29.97 drop but 30 so I discussed a little bit last week or the week before about why drop frame exists has to do with color television okay so that's set up and then my counter right here let's see something here I've got this set up so the beginning of my session is at one hour and I'm at one beat one bar one beat one these three digits here are called ticks that's not for this class that's the, that's the subdivision of a beat the resolution of the subdivision of a beat uh, I could get into that if you need to know that but it gets a little bit too tangential for what we're talking about now. So the way I set up my counter in Pro Tools is I always have my musical reference on the top, and I've got a sub counter that has my SMPTE on it. That. So this is the standard uh, way that they came up with for the time code here. And I'm going to set the resolution of the grid here to 16th notes, right? And so if I go to the second eighth note of bar one, this right here is going to change to 12. This is my frames. So we got hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. Let me show you that on the big counter so it's easier to see. Hours, we're at one hour. We went over why things start at one hour. Minutes, seconds, and frames. So that's what the SMPTE clock looks, looks like. Every second of frames per second starts off at zero, which is this last number on the right here. So in other words, if I go to two seconds in, Two seconds in starts at two seconds and no frames. So that means that if I'm going to go to the first, second, eighth note of bar one, can anybody, the second, eighth note of beat one of bar one, right, can anybody guess what frame out of 24 that's on if it starts at zero? Where if, oh, it's 60 beats per minute. That's our, fr that's our tempo. Yes, you're right, Mark. Thank you. Um, so if we're at the first, second eighth note of beat one, what frame would that be at? It's some number between zero and 23. Here we go. All right. 12. Yeah. 12, right? So what a DAW has is a calculator, which helps you out. So you understand the concepts that we went over before with the Hollywood clicks and now we're blessed that we can figure this stuff out. So if I 
type in a SMPTE time right here, right, I can figure out where a hit is. So let's say that a hit happens at, if I wanted something, if something happened at, let's say, 18, that would be the fourth 16th note of that beat. So at 60 beats per minute, the subdivisions of a beat in terms of frames are zero for the first part of the beat, 12 frames for the second eighth note. If we want to get 16th notes, it's six frames. So the first 16th note of a beat is on zero. The second 16th note of a beat is on six. The third 16th note of the beat, which is the same as the second eighth note, is on 12 frame, the 12th frame. And the fourth 16th note is on the 18th frame. So it's easy. It's, you're dividing 24 into four S equal subdivisions. So you've got 0, 6, 12, 18. Eighth notes is two subdivisions of 24, 0 and 12. 24 is really good, uh, 60 beats per minute is really good because it matches up so well with the 24 frames that we can even do triplets. So let's see if anybody can help me out. So if you have eighth note triplets, there are how many eighth notes in one beat? Three. Correct. And let's say we want to do something in triplets. The first triplet would be on frame zero, zero, right? The fir the, which is the first frame of every second. What you'd have to do is divide 24 by three and then figure out where the second eighth note triplet would be on. Eight. 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 Excellent. And the third... Sixteen. The third eighth note triplet? Sixteen. Sixteen. Right. And then, so that's some of the basics about setting up your DAW and some of the basics about timing. Now, if we are to change tempo here, and we'll make this 90, right? These calculations become diff diff different. So if I put in the second eighth note of beat one, uh, oops, excuse me, I didn't change, tempo didn't change, thank you. You see it's at eight, right? So 480 is an eighth note. If I do 720, that's the uh, that's a sixteenth note. That's the th fourth sixteenth note of the first beat. We get a frame of twelve. If I go to beat two, I'm at sixteen. So I still haven't gone through a second twenty-four frames, right? I haven't gone through a second of time because it's a faster tempo, so it's or less frames per beat. Let's just keep th that in mind. That. You would take, what you would do is, and I went over this before, is you would take your spotting notes, right? In Pro Tools, you would set your main counter to be time code, and then you would enter the spots that you want to catch as markers. And that would give you a framework to work with. So let's say my first hit is at 12 seconds and, uh, whoops, 12 seconds and eight frames, right? That's my marker right there. Great. Now, if my second hit is at, let's say, 45 seconds and 18 frames, Second hit. Let me go back to time. And we would look at this, and we'd see that the first hit happens 
at 90 beats per minute, which is what we are right now, bar 5, beat 3, the second eighth note. So that sort of lines up pretty well. And the second hit, which is right here, that ends up kind of in between the grid, right? So this is where one of the 16th notes is, and this is where the next 16th note is. So this is the, uh, the end of, of the beat, and then this is the last 16th note, and the hit happens in the middle. So what do you do in that case? and you're using a click track, right? Change your tempo? You can do that, but I like to keep my tempos fairly steady at first because if you're going to be having people play to this, right, you don't want to be faster and slower, faster and slower. You want to sort of keep a step, steady tempo. One of two things. If you're going to change tempo, I would change it a couple of measures before the hit to speed it up or slow it down so you can get something on that. Or if I'm writing, you have two options. You can have the hit come in a little bit before or a little bit after. And depending upon the kind of hit it is, it, it, does, it might not have to be that close because you're only a few frames off, right? So this, this hit is on frame 17. And so we're three frames off. That might be noticeable. That might not be noticeable. But... When you get really experienced at this, you can actually change the feel of a scene by, and if you want it to be a little edgier, you might anticipate the hit by a fraction of a second. Or if you want to be reactive, you would come in a second after the hit. I do that all the time. And it, it, it's, it's something that you can kind of control how it affects the audience. I typically like to come in just a little bit. If, I'm, if I can't get anything right on the, the, the scene change, I like to come in just a second, like a fraction of a second afterwards is better for me than being a little bit early. Uh, but for right now, you just make your choice and do the best you can if, when, and when we start to score a film. All right. So, now think about this, right? At 90 beats a minute, the second hit comes in on measure 18, basically, let's call it, right? So you have 18 measures of music to write. If your tempo is 50, uh, hold on a second. It happens in the middle of measure 10. So you see how much less music you have to write at slower tempos, right? It's, it's, it's interesting, right? So this is, these are things that you have to think about when you're, when you're picking your pace for your piece, about how, much, how many measures of music you have to write. All right, so let's leave Pro Tools for a second. This is, you know, introduction to this stuff to get you guys thinking about this. Any questions on this before I close out of Pro Tools? So would you have a, like a list of tempos, Pete, that you would go for if you're using 24 frames so the math is better? Um, what I do is I figure out, I have an idea of the piece, the, like the, 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 pay, the music needs to be a little bit up-tempo here, right? So then I ballpark a tempo in, and then I s watch the film, and I see how the film plays against the click track. And I adjust the tempo up and down based upon that. So if things 
are coming in a little bit too uh, in, in strange spots, I might make it a little slower or a little faster, right? But there are tempos that are friendlier to 24 beats per minute, and that would be 60, 90, 120, 144. So there are tempos that are friendlier to getting things right on, having a frame correspond to a, um, a musical subdivision or a, a beat. That, that's definitely true. All right, so here we've got 60 beats a minute. We've got a bunch of, let's do one more thing. Uh, let's make this 15 so we get a little bit more space. All right, so we've got something set up here. And in this notation program, if you go to play, you can import a video here. And but what we're going to do is we are going to set up our time code. So the time code of the first bar is one hour, no minutes, no seconds, and no frames. And we're going to go here, and we're going to set 24 frames. It gives you all these options for the different frame setups. You can do this where you show the time code above every bar or at the start of every system or none. All right, so I've got this at bar three, beat two, and then you can name it. Um, let's say door opens. Great, and now our second one, let's say something happens at one hour, 32 seconds, and 18 frames. First glance. Now notice how they've put the six, 16th notes at 0.75 beats, right? And so right here you've got where your stuff is happening. So let's, let me zoom in so it's a little easier for you to see. So right here, my first hit, we've got our Simpty, bar three, beat two, the door opens. I'm just making this up. At one hour, 32 seconds and 18 frames, we have our first glance. That's at bar nine, beat one, the fourth, 16th note, all right? So, if you are composing in a notation program, this is, this is similar to using markers in Pro Tools. What you want to do is you want to get your outline set up first before you start writing. So, this is a little clumsy, but I think you get the idea, right? Um, you know, I, you type things in to here, and for some reason it doesn't take. And that's been an issue, not just now, but every time I've done this for all my classes, which is one reason why I don't use notation. And also because notation is not, notation is a road, is a road map. It's not a performance. In a DAW, you're actually creating a performance. 